Hello, everybody. My name is Giulio Sandrini, and uh, I'm a consultant for Warm Hover Research as a kernel developer. And today I'm going to present you what's new in the version 12 of the Wolfram language in the domain of machine learning, uh, dedicated to image processing in particular. I'm in the image processing group, and I'm going to present tonight together with my colleague, Markus Amalsik, who is present in the chat and can answer your questions if you have any. Okay, let's let's start from something that you can all have access to. So it's the main Wolfram website, which is just www.wolfram.com. And from here, you can see that you have a section which is what's new in the Wolfram language version 12. So this is exactly what we want to talk about today. So let's dig in. Uh, here you get an introduction. And uh, there are other Twitch talks about different sections of the language. What we care about uh, today is um, image audio and specifically machine learning for images. So let's go here. OK, so what, what's, what's new mainly in, in this domain? We've been working very hard on um, updating several built-in function. It uh, doesn't sound sexy, but makes them way more useful in actual computation. Something like uh, face analysis greatly benefits from having a strong, robust face detector. Uh, we have introduced new things like object detection. We have improved text detection and uh, all sorts of things. But let, 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 let's try to see point by point exactly what is new in the language. So um, here's brief summary, and uh, you can go on the page yourself and uh, experiment with the examples. I'm going to show you in a minute how to do that. Um, as you can see, we have uh, some built-in um, machine learning, and this is basically summarized in this first row, the product page. And these are functions that we kind of repackage for you to be able to um, use them in a concise way using single, very powerful high-level commands. And we can have something very, very simple and uh, more mostly aesthetic as the change in the style of an image, uh, going to something which is very, very complex, uh, like building object recognition or uh, tracking objects in, uh, in video stream and things like this. Uh, another, another sector we have been greatly uh, improving in the past few versions, and we are still working on improving this is um, face analysis, starting from face detection to uh, extracting the scriptor for faces and integrating our, our face analysis stack with some models from the wild. I'm going to explain what they are soon. Um, another thing we are briefly touching today is uh, uh, built-in models for image uh, um, analysis, and uh, these models are all available in our repo. You can immediately download them and start playing with them. And I'm going to show a few of them in detail. Another topic for today is uh, network uh, um, surgery and modification. So we start from specific neural network, or in general machine learning uh, um, functions, and we want to tweak them in order to um, be tailored specifically to the task that we have at hand. And last but not least, another sector we'll be working on uh, improving is uh, test uh, uh, text detection and recognition. OK, so let me, if you have never seen one of our Twitch videos, um, let me explain how these, page, these pages work. So you can click on one example. And this will take you to this page, which means, makes some explanation, some links, and more, the most important part, some code. So all this code you can click and copy. So this thing you can immediately paste in a notebook and start experimenting with this. And uh, here is uh, some result for this function. And as I mentioned, this is a function that does style transfer. So it takes one image in input and uh, Another image that will provide us with the style, in this case, is um, a Van Gogh painting, very famous for this specific uh, task. And what this function will do, it will, underneath, it will use a neural network 
to copy over the texture from this image and apply it to the content on this image. So we get still a dog, but is uh, has this sort of painting-like feeling. As, uh, as, many, as many functions involving neural networks, there are trade-offs between uh, how much you want to be fast and how much you want to be, uh, let's say, accurate, even if it's in a broad sense, like a um, visual task like this. Um, to trade off between these two, uh, this function, like many others, provides a performance goal option. And if you set it to quality, this I'm showing you this pre-evaluated because it will take a bit more. So if you don't have a GPU, um, it'll take a while to compute, but the result is a much better fusion of this style. So this is using a pre-evaluated network. This is training a network underneath to build the best possible tra style transfer between these two images. And you can, you can go wild with this. If you want to take different paintings, for example, you can try and transfer different styles, as you can see here. Another neat thing you can do is you can use a weight parameter to, pro to, to um, provide a um, specific target for the function and say how much you want to combine of the original image and the target style. Let's see here this pre-render animation. So as you can see, we go from basically full image to full texture. And in between, we have like this kind of results which we might be happy with. So this is kind of a demo function, and it's for our light start uh, introduction to the to the topic. And this is not much more than the repackaging of a new of a neural network, but uh, you have to keep in mind that some of these networks have extremely complex mechanics for evaluation. So you have to massage the input a bit. And what we are trying to do with functions like this is we take over all the pre-processing, post-processing fusion of different network results, everything is done uh, under the hood. We just expose the parameters that you may want to tweak. And uh, this makes for a very simple, easy to type, easy to use uh, functionality. Let's move to the next example. Um, this is a bit of um, uh, going wilder with what you've seen before, just to say that we can, uh, you can use uh, a single function as a building block to create uh, uh, something more extreme. So here, this is, uh, I'm just using this function on the image itself. And what it creates is basically emphasize the texture of the image. And I can, I can use any, any functional, pure functional command, like nest list that we have in the language. And this will create a sequence of transformation that progressively makes this image more and more uh, like its texture. And if you go to the extreme, we get something which uh, looks way more like an abstract painting. And uh, here we have also, I've pre-rendered, this takes a bit because I have to do this 100 times, but basically this is what you get. So we, we go from the original image to something that basically is just extracting the single style element. And, and, but this to show that uh, you can basically play with this uh, very powerful, uh, a very complicated construct like any other piece of the language. Changing topic, another big thing that has been introduced in version 12, and um, it will definitely be built upon in the following versions, is object recognition. Um, as it is in the um, language style, we tried again to package something which is very complex into commands that are pretty simple to use. So the task that you want to perform here is to recognize subparts of an image like this um, and tag them with a, with, with a label that says what they are. So for example, here we would expect to find four glasses and, and one bottle. So the minimal, uh, the, 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 brief, the, the most, let's say, uh, uh, brief way to do something like this in the language is just to use the function image cases. Image cases, takes an image in and tries at its best to give a classification for all the subparts that are present. So in this case, it finds four glasses indeed and one bottle. Uh, there are certain classes that are present in this function, so this, it cannot recognize everything, but um, within these classes, it will try its best to give an accurate result. 
Um, we've introduced also convenience uh, functions that work together with uh, this object detection to provide more uh, specific information. For example, you might want just to have the bounding box or instead of the of a sub image. So you will just very dramatically call image bounding boxes. And this will give you exactly what you need to start operating on them. These uh, are um, geometric primitives. And so you can use it in the rest of the language. You can compute the area of these. You can just plug it in back into some uh, uh, image annotation tool, like highlight image. And this let's immediately create an annotated version of the original image. Uh, another thing you might be interested in uh, to use in an idiomatic way is uh, where are the objects, just a single position. And the shortcut of this is image position. But here I'm using an operator directly in the highlight image functions to mark where the wine glasses are in this picture. And um, as who's familiar with the language might recall, we have already a way to identify single objects in images, which is image identify. And that function has a companion function, which is called image instance queue, to uh, tell you if the uh, specific object is in the image. And uh, of course, when we talk about sub images, we can do something similar. So we can ask, uh, does this image contain a bottle? Yes. Does this image contain a car as a sub element? No. And last but not least, we have a very easy uh, top level uh, interface to this, which you can use just to get um, an idea of what the result might be, which is called image contents and gives you an easy format data set that contains uh, the trims of what was found in the image. The concept like here, you know, wine glass, fork, the whole table, where it is in the image and how sure the function is that uh, we are indeed talking about this specific concept. And uh, here is a small code that you can copy paste and use for yourself or modify if you need. And that will create an annotated version of the original image with all the detected concepts. Let's see another, another use for, for these functions and uh, something more like application oriented. So here I put an extract of a um, small video clip where there is a dog moving through. The, the frame. And um, something that might be useful, for example, if you have um, a camera in your backyard and you, you, you want to see if there's animal moving or a, a bugger trying to, to break in, you, you might want to track specific objects moving through the picture. So right now we don't have yet video capabilities, but you can still work on a video frame like this by importing a list of frames with this import command. So you point it to your file, and you get a list of images. I'm taking in the frame rate because I want to convert this to actual seconds. And what I'm doing is I'm mapping the image contains key function we've just seen to uh, the list of, of frames. As you can see, this is the result. So mm, the network is pretty sure with more than 50% uh, probability that there is a dog between, let's say, second three and something two seconds, seven and something. And visually we can see these are all the green frames are the frame where the dog was uh, identified for like with uh, this uncertainty in the image. So let's use this to build an application. We can use an image position to on these images to find out the trajectory of the dog in the image. So here is the center of mass of the dog moving around and then we can try to create a bounding box and apply that to the video frame. So for example, here is the dog coming in. And when the network starts detecting that, you can see if you have a bounding box around that until it disappears. So this is a small, simple application that you can basically do with two lines of code once you have imported your images. Or you can point these to an external source of images and run this. Let's go back to the to the main, uh, sorry, let's go back to the main list of examples. And um, to talk about face, I, I would just want to move to, to a notebook to say some of these things interactively. And so let's go to the face analysis 
group of examples. And let's see how we have improved uh, something as basic as, um, as a basic building block, like find faces, which we have had in the language for several versions. But in version 12, uh, there's a major, major improvement. And this also has been achieved by switching to more advanced, more sophisticated machine learning methods. As you can see, we weren't performing real well on this image, actually pretty badly, because a lot of these faces are non-frontal faces, and uh, our old detector was not very good on these. So you can see the new detector, which is the green uh, boxes, performs much, much better. And uh, you can see this, uh, for example, by stressing the detector a bit and uh, try to use, uh, like here I'm controlling this with a time, and this is detecting, you can see some of these uh, are not picked, but in many, many frames, you, you pick all of the images. So it's a huge, huge, huge improvement on the detection of uh, any sort of rotated faces. And uh, of course, you don't have to trust single image example. We have been running a lot of benchmarks on um, publicly available data sets like FDDB or Celeb A, and we have on average 30% increase in quality across the board. And uh, also not to be discounted, this is not at the expense of speed. Indeed, the function is uh, a lot faster in version 12, especially uh, evaluated on big images. Like here, we are evaluating this on nine megapixel images. And uh, we see that we improved by 40% roughly. So how, how can you use uh, advanced machine learning to then operate on faces that we have detected in an image. So let's see one example we've been putting together here. And uh, still, this is all available on the product page. You can uh, go and copy this and paste it in your notebook and play with this yourself. So let's say what we want to do here, we want to start from this image of the family. We want to detect faces. We can even see them. So the, uh, here are the faces that you have been detecting here. So we want to run. Uh, the new facial features function that will extract, uh, in this case, we want to extract eyes and mouth point. And here, let's see what this is doing. So we extract some landmarks. And what do we use this landmark for? In this example, I'm going to try to use them to align those images, uh, which is still a useful uh, step per se. For example, you want to use them for training another network or for any sort of other applications. But in this case, I'm going to use the aligning images to perform interpolation between all these families' pictures. So I'm going to run the find geometry transform on all these landmarks. And here, I'm putting some reference, arbitrary reference, where I'm putting roughly at uh, one third, two thirds eyes and mouth, because I want them in a fixed position. So I'm running this transformation. And then I'm, uh, I'm, when I found this transformation, I can use the image transformation function, providing the original faces and the five transformation functions. And this will produce five aligned faces. Since here, now, all the eyes are exactly in this position 3080, 7080 that I requested. And the center of the mouth is at this position 50, uh, 35 that I've requested as well here. So now that I've done this, performing interpolation is as easy as calling the function blend. I can directly call this on the list of faces. And what I get is this nice interactive way to morph between one image and the other by blending the content. And here, basically, is the final result of what we're doing here. Let's see another application and uh, something that we can still do with, um, with facial features is to perform, like build a simple face recognizer. How, how to do this? This is like something similar to what you might have in your phone app or computer app where you want to group together pictures of the same subject. So I've uh, scraped a bit more pictures from this nice family in order to basically train a classifier for each, uh, each member of the family. And what I'm doing is I'm using facial features again, but now querying a different property, which is the scriptor. The scriptor is a vector that contains 
a fit representation on an image. So in this case, I can maybe look at one of them. This is a very long numerical vector. And something like this is much better uh, for the computer to understand than just looking at the original image. And let's try this, for example. We have a feature space plus function in version 12 that can basically try to compress into a 2D all these big, big, big vectors. And uh, so we can attempt to see uh, visually how these vector can clusterize. And you can see that just by moving to this different representation, I'm able to, um, to work in this embedding space where images of the same person are closer together. So this is a good sign, because if, that means that if you use this uh, very big multidimensional vector as a representation for the image, we can then define uh, the distances between these vector representation to be the distance between the actual person represented in the picture. So then it's very easy just by providing this to train a classifier. This is very, very fast to train. Then I'm taking a different image. Let me see. This is actually a different image of the same family. And then I can just map the classifier on all the faces. And here it says, uh, this is sorted by probability. So it says that this face here uh, belongs to the dad. This is the first son, second son, the mom and the daughter. And let's try here to visualize this in a way that is most useful. And actually, daughter, mom, and dad are correct. Now, I don't remember if son one was the blonde one. Let's go up and see. Here it is. Yes, the first son was the blonde one. So we indeed got all the member of the family correctly classified just by providing a few simple uh, examples. Sorry for the scrolling. Now, let's try an image in a different point in time to see if this is robust. So this is another image where I have a bit older version of the same family, just three people here. Let's try on this image what happens with the classifier. And yes, still correct. So uh, I'm not claiming that it's super powerful, but uh, the features are at least a little robust against variation in time. So this is a very, very simple example. It's nothing sophisticated. But uh, you can build upon this, and uh, we try to provide building blocks to create applications like this. Uh, last but not least, let's try see uh, how we can apply a um, model from our repository to perform some uh, uh, face application task. Uh, here, I'm putting a link. This is also available on our website. Actually, let's. Let's go here. This is our neural net repo. I'm sure many of you have already seen that. And from here, you can get neural network that nicely packaged in this net model object. You can just click on this and paste it in your notebook, start playing with this. Uh, here, I have already pasted. And uh, once you evaluate this, the, the system will download the network. I've pre-downloaded this not to waste too much time today, but uh, it typically is a few seconds to a few minutes. And this is a very big structure that performs many different operations. And the final um, um, task of this network is recreating a big array that contains a 3D reconstruction of the uh, shape of this face. So let's try it with the face taken from the wild. If I apply the net on the face, this gives me a um, 3D tensor, so we can directly plug it into image 3D. And uh, bam, this is the reconstruction. So this is the best guess of the network of what the original 3D shape of this face would be. But um, we don't need to just use a network. We can, uh, given that we have it in the language, we can use all the other features to play a bit with it. For example, here. I can take in the information from the image and resize this volume. This orientation is arbitrary, so I'll have to set it myself. So now this, this face now has the same proportion as what I had in the original image, where here it was pretty squared, like default network output. And then I can, for example, take slices from 
the original image and use them as texture for my 3D shape. And here, for example, it's pretty fast. I can apply it real time. These are slices applied on this image. So I went with a few lines of code from 2D image to 3D model of the face, combining a neural network and plus standard image processing functions. Let's see another given that I, I briefly mentioned the neural network repository. Let's see what kind of things you can find here that pertain to the uh, to the image analysis domain. So let's depart from faces to do something else here. The um, uh, network that you want to analyze here is this uh, depth perception network, and it's a similar problem to what we've seen now, but uh, this is a more general network. It's not tailored specifically to faces. So probably on faces, it will perform a little worse. This is a generic uh, truth. The most um, specific is your task, the better the result. But this uh, uh, has a trade-off between specificity and accuracy. So here I'm taking, let me redefine my net variable. This is a different network, similar idea, but different structure inside. This is, again, giving a depth map of my, um, like for, like, instead of giving me the 3D shapes, it just gives me uh, a single numerical value that represents the depth of the pixel in the image. So here, using this image, I would expect all these to be background and all this stuff to sort of pop out the image. Let's see if uh, this is correct. So I'm going to evaluate the net on the image. This produces, uh, hopefully, pretty fast, a 2D array. Let's see if it's working. Yeah, here it is. So this array here contains uh, the estimated depth for each pixel. This doesn't say much. So let's plug it into the, an image object and rescale it. OK, so where is black, it's closer to me. And when it, where is white, it's farther away. This uh, kind of goes in the right direction, this part I was expecting to be closer, and indeed it is, this part as well. It's not so good with the clouds here, but let's try to see it together with the original pictures to get a better idea. So here we have, uh, here it is. Uh, this is a surface plot. I'm using the list plot 3D functions to map this surface, and you can see pixel here are indeed closer to the viewer, while the background is farther away. Let's try to use a texture to get something more pleasing to the eye by using the texture command here. And yep, here it is. So indeed, here I don't have data, but the network understands that it has to push back this background. So this is another example of what you can do with uh, uh, neural network as building blocks in uh, image uh, analysis algorithm. Uh, this is a small but neat one, and you can use it to impress your friends. So this network was trained on a very specific task, so to link together images and a location on the surface of the Earth. So you can take, um, again, let's reevaluate this net. You can uh, take an image of some famous landmark, like the Giza Pyramid, and uh, once you evaluate the network, you get the geoposition out. And uh, this is a tag uh, object, it's not just a simple point. We are telling the language that this represents a position on the Earth. So we can directly use it uh, with, uh, within our uh, suit of um, geographical functions. So here I'm putting this uh, into geographics, telling it that it has to create a geomarker at this position. And also extend 4,000 kilometers in each and every direction. And indeed, I am actually pretty close to Jidza here in Egypt, which is what I was expecting. Let's uh, change domain completely, and let's try another net model here. I'm just trying to give you a brief overview of what are the possibilities of these models, if you haven't seen many of them. Uh, super resolution is an old and veritable concept in image processing, and basically it consists in um, create an upsample version of an image, trying to fill in, fill in for the missing data with uh, some algorithm 
and the idea here is that we want to use a neural network as uh, uh, the um, back end for the upsampling of the network. Again, I'm taking a network from the repository. I encourage you to browse that and play with these models yourself. What this is doing is taking an image and giving an upsampled version of that as the output. So we can see here, this is the evaluation function we provide you uh, to directly massage the input and work with the net. And uh, let's apply this to this small image of a tiger. It's indeed small. If I increase this, if I drag and, and resize, you can see that this is very pixelated. I would like to have a better version of this. This is not an easy image. It has, a, it has fur. Uh, there's a lot of small details here. So let's, let's see how this network uh, compares to the, oops, oh, sorry, to the more standard uh, image processing methods. OK. So here it is. We can look at them together. As you can see, this network tried its best. And actually, these, all this fur, all this uh, um, detail of the tiger, they come back pretty neat as lines, as uh, well-defined regions. They don't have any blurriness here. And let's compare it to more standard image resampling technique. I'm using here our built-in command image resize to make the image twice as big. And I'm using the cubic resampling, which was what the network was working on to optimize and give better version. And I'm comparing with more sophisticated uh, resampling algorithm that uh, takes more time but produces better results. As you can see, this default cubic, it's pretty blurry uh, here on the eye where I have a fur or here on the details. Um, almost performs better but still not as good and the refined version that is produced by the neural network. So this is another example of one thing that you can do with uh, building support for neural networks in the language. Now, a pretty hot sector that I'm going to show given that I have some time today is uh, uh, GAN models. Uh, GAN models are basically paired networks where one network is a generator and tries to create a new image and another network is uh, a discriminator and tries to detect if the image generated is a good image or a bad image. So here, this is a very famous model that uh, we have converted and you can directly import and use in the language and is called uh, Pix2Pix. And this specific version was trained on photo images to make street map. Uh, so let's now use uh, our geosuit get uh, uh, an image of the uh, city of La Las Vegas in random position. Here we see we have some uh, some houses, streets. We have sand, I guess. Here we have trees, and um, what we want to do is to just apply this network on this image and see what are the best guess. And here it is. So we get out here. We have streets. We have even a tentative. Uh, uh, one-way indication, and we have an approximation of where an actual map software would put the um, the, the house symbols. Uh, as you can see, it's not perfect. Like this street is here, but this is not. But uh, this is like kind of the best synthesis that the network can do with this. A bit more impressive, in my opinion, is the companion network, which was trained on street map in order to produce a photo. So I'm getting this other network here, and I'm getting this crop of the map. So let's see something like this. And what I have here is, um, again, like a few streets, houses, one-way roads. Here, some green area. And let's see what's the best guess of this network on this image. You can see the network goes pretty wild. It creates houses, some weird agglomerate, trees, sort of a park, and actual streets. So this is a bit like a game. These networks are still in their infancy, but there's a lot of potential here. And we try to provide you with a way to play and, uh, and um, look into them right out of the box. OK, so let's see another, another topic here. This. Uh, um, Net surgery analysis topic is uh, basically where we take 
pre-built networks or architectures and we try to retrain them to perform a different task. Given that this involves training and uh, is not something that we can do real time in the uh, span of a talk, I'm just going to show you the result of a training that I did myself before putting these on this product page. And uh, you still have the elements to reproduce this yourself. If you want, you can do this training on CPUs or GPUs. So feel free to get these and experiment. What we are doing here is a very, very uh, common request is you have a network that performs classification, but you want to extend it to classify some more classes, or you want to retailor it to classify different classes. So here I'm taking the famous Inception V1 model from Google and is uh, again in our net repository. And um, to my dismay, this model doesn't know the difference between a camel and a dromedary. Actually, this network has only dromedary inside. So this says dromedary, but this also says dromedary. And I'm not happy about that. And it also is pretty sure. So it, it doesn't really have this class in its knowledge base. What I want to do is uh, see if I can, can fairly easily retrain this model in order to understand the difference between camera and dromedary. And uh, here's the simple way to do that. So what I'm, I'm going to do here is I'm going to take the network and I'm going to drop the final layer where I compute the classification and the probability. And uh, I'm substituting that with two new layers one that performs this linear operation that will help me compute the different classifications between uh, dromedary and camel, and then the final um, normalization, normalization layer that will convert this result in a probability. And I also want to tell this network that it doesn't have to give me out numbers. I want to get nice formatted entities with which I can work later on in the language. So this is my new net. And uh, now I just need the right data to train this network. One way to do it is, uh, without even leaving your notebook, is to use the web image search function. And um, I'm using this query string, which is Bakri and Camel. And uh, dromedary, I put animal here to be a bit more sure that uh, I get the pictures I want. I did some experiments before. And I'm asking 300 small images. I don't need big stuff for training. The thumbnail is enough and will save me bandwidth. Once I've uh, downloaded these images, I just uh, put them together in a training set. Here we see I'm telling like all these camel images, they will have to go to this camel concept, all the dromedary images will have to go to the dromedary concept. And once I have these two building blocks, the new network and the training set, I can just call NetTrain, you can see here, uh, it's a very simple call of our training function. I put the new architecture, I put the training set, I ask to get out uh, a net train result object that contains all the properties so I can do some analysis on this later. And I'm also telling the train to save up 10% of the data, actually, sorry. Um, yeah, sorry, 10% of the data to, um, to do some validations and do some testing. Uh, another important bit, I want to be fast and I don't have uh, enough images to retrain this from scratch. So I'm just saying, train the classifier layer, don't train the rest of the network. So I'm just uh, here, I'm just um, doing what is called in the literature fine tuning. I'm saying I trust this network to be a good feature extractor. This network knows about a lot of images in the wild and I want to leverage this knowledge and just train a classifier on top of those features. As you can see, this is what you would get at the end of the training with the loss function going down. This is the loss on the training example, but we see that the loss is also going down on my small validation set. That hopefully means that uh, this will do a good job on unseen images. Let's try these two images I took from, uh, not from a training set. And indeed, now this is dromedary and this is finally a camera to countries and this is a camel. So accuracy is pretty high, 98% here, 95% here. I'm pretty satisfied with this. One thing you can do is, of course, I picked an arbitrary model. I use Inception D1. You can use any network in the uh, net repo or build your own that performs specification. 
And here I did the same procedure with four of them to try and understand a bit what's going on in terms of uh, the, how accurate and fast the network is. We can see that at the end of the training, we are with just 300 images, we cannot do much better than 10, 15% error. And uh, we see that the best network at the end is uh, these uh, ResNet, these small ResNets. And uh, this is interesting because that means that uh, for such a small task like this, we don't need a very long network with 100 uh, and one layers like ResNet 101. We can use this small network. And uh, nice, nice detail, then we can track using this, let me scroll up a bit, using this net train result object that I, I got here in output, you can not just query for something obvious like the actual network that I've trained, but you can also query for some other information like how much was the training time and uh, how many examples I could uh, uh, process per second and what was the final loss, for example. So here we can see that the um, Inception V1 that I've shown above trained in 16 seconds on a GPU. And uh, while a big network like uh, Resident 1.1 on v Inception V3, it took likely double the time to train. This might be significant if you have more examples or if you don't have a GPU like me and uh, you have to ask your friends for, for the training. So here we can see that a small network like Resident 50, it's still pretty fast process. Uh, 50 to 70% more examples and uh, bigger networks, but still gives you good accuracy. So this is an example of uh, how you can take an existing network and repurpose it for your task. Let's see another uh, type of training. In, in this case, we take again a network which is small as NAPI as we see now, the Resident 50 network, this was trained on image classification, but now we want to do something which is completely different. We want to train this network to estimate the age of a person. Now, this, this network was uh, tailored to perform classification, so how do, we, how do we repurpose this to give us uh, a single number, a single real number, as the, or integer number as the age of a person? Okay, here I'm showing you a nice trick to do that. What we can do is that we can recast, this is a typical way, uh, we recast this uh, um, prediction problem as a classification problem. We know that the age of a person is pretty bounded. It goes from zero to, let's say, in this model, 100 years. Sorry for who's above 100. <laughs> I'm not going to get them here. And uh, what we do is we do uh, something similar to what we did before. So here I'm using this uh, network. Again, I'm dropping the final two layers with the classifier and the probability estimation. And I'm adding a new classifier that will predict what's the probability of the, the content of an image being a person in a given age. What I'm also adding here is I want to have a bit more accuracy and I don't have many images in this. So I'm using this image augmentation layer to basically try to uh, spice up things a bit, flip the image, move it, so in order to add some noise to my training data. Now, once I have this network ready, I can, for example, give it random parameters and evaluate this on the random image to understand what's going on. And this is, will be the typical output of this network. So for each specific value, we have a prediction of the probability of uh, the person being of that age. We can see that this is complete garbage, but I was also starting from a random image. We would like this to be an accurate uh, uh, estimation of the age distribution. In order to do that, we need to define a suitable loss function. Uh, if you're not familiar with uh, how neural networks, neural networks work, a loss function is basically measuring how good we are performing on the task. So given that I'm predicting ages, what I'm doing is I'm putting here a constant vector with all my edges, and I'm doing the dot product between all the probabilities and the value of the edges to basically compute the mean. So the, what this, uh, this uh, loss will measure in the end is uh, 
how good the mean uh, of the distribution predicted by the network compares to the actual age of the person. And you can see here, I have the vector of ages, the input that is given from the network. I compute the mean, and I compare it with my loss function to the target age. And this is how bad I'm doing. And uh, the training procedure will try to bring down this number as much as possible. So here is a training set that I took from the wild. Uh, I put a link here. You can use something like UTK phases, or like there are a lot of databases where you can do, you can, you can take ages out and do something like this. Uh, it's a nice exercise. And again, this is a very simple um, call. You, in order to do all the optimization, you just call net train, you put your model, you put the training set that looks like this, and you also want to put a validation set to get some actual estimation um, outside your, your, your training data. And of course, you want to use the custom loss that we have just defined. Okay, what happens with this? This trains in roughly 20 to 30 minutes on a GPU. So I'm just going to show you the final result. Put an image like this. And then, bam, this is what I get. I do the dot product between the ages and the probabilities. And like the average age of this person, the average prediction is 31 year, year old. And here, this is a full distribution predicted by the net. We see we have some random spikes here, but on average, like the, the mean is around this value of a distribution. Let's see here, we had another couple of uh, nice uh, surgery examples. A uh, question that we've been asked many times in different demonstrations and uh, conferences is, what exactly these networks are doing? Uh, a nice uh, feature of the Wolfram language is that you can use the built-in surgery capabilities to build your own exploration tools. And uh, this example was put together by my colleague, Marcus van Alsik, and is basically taking out uh, uh, our built-in uh, classification model, which is in the model that is back in the image identify function, and is trying to find out uh, uh, what are exactly the areas of the image that this network uh, uses to build up its answer. In order to do this, to do this, we have mm, he uses this uh, nifty approach, which is uh, basically with this function here, take a patch and cover uh, part of the image. And uh, what we can do then is we can brute force some uh, information out of the network. We can create many of these images and try to find out which is the patch that most uh, affect mostly the um, the final result of the classification. Here we see we have this nice big code that does everything for you. We just want to apply that. And uh, uh, we see, for example, that uh, um, these area here are what this specific network, again, this is not valid for any network. This is just valid for the network here that we are providing as argument. This specific network will uh, use these specific areas of image to classify this uh, as a Morgan horse, and uh, this gives uh, uh, using these parts can give 73% uh, probability in the classification. And of course, this is just uh, a part of the image at uh, standard pixel scale. A nice uh, thing you can do is you can just plug this in our uh, standard core language functions and create uh, a table of sensitivity maps. The, each one of them by rescaling using this scale factor here, what we put in our function. And so we can build a multi-scale sensitivity map that basically tries to infer uh, both things as small. You see like uh, the word is like here, you have some like bigger scale structure and here very bright smaller scale structure. And it's, this is a bit different from the single scale map that you had before. And um, here, for example, this is a very interesting result. We see that we have a wolf on the side, and we can see very clearly that the network is not focusing on the background, is only focusing on the wolf area, and this allows it to give a very high, very confident prediction for gray wolf. If we move to the scale independent area, we see that the main focus is here, where the face is, and then it blends out to the different parts of the wolf. 
this this tool that we've just built uh, gives us a lot of extra information, and we can use it not just to predict uh, how strong a network is, but also how weak a network is. And using using it on this other image, which is a wolf on on top of this is a model of a wolf on top of a piece of terrain, I guess. And um, we see that the network is focusing a lot on this area here. And this is probably the cause for this misclassification as soap dish. And uh, you know, like without a tool like this, would be completely opaque to the to the end user why why this network is giving this classification. But we can see here which was tricked by a lot of details in this area. And uh, let's see, let's try this our sensitivity map with a different network. This is Inception version three, uh, which is a model that we have converted in our repository. And ha, ah, this is uh, plainly a very difficult image. This is gives giving a bad classification as triceratops. Not very sure, but it's looking all over. So again, not as neat as what we had here, where the network was looking exactly at the right features to predict what the content of the image was. Um, let's see one last example of uh, network surgery and. Uh, this is what we typically call adversarial attack. And uh, given that we're just seeing that this network can be tricked, we can engineer the trick, the tricky image, in order to get misclassifications ourselves. And uh, this is a very active uh, research sector because, of course, uh, you have a lot of applications for network like this, like autonomous driving or um, in uh, factory pipelines, you want to be able to accurately, accurately identify objects just by using a camera, for example, without anything more sophisticated. But this becomes useless if uh, this network can be easily fooled. So you want to be able to study how to fool networks and how make networks robust against fooling. Um, this example here shows uh, how to create one of these adversarial examples because they are adversary with respect to the classification. And what we're trying here is we're trying to cockroach a tiger. So what happens here? Here we take, again, standard inception architecture. And uh, we can see that if we apply this network on this cockro cockroach image, we get a pretty confident probability, like a uh, classification as cockroach, like 96% probability. If we apply the network on the tiger, Again, not so sure. Maybe it's tiger, maybe it's tiger cat, another subspecies, but uh, still pretty sure 72%, almost 73, that this is a tiger. So let's see how we can build an image that will trick this specific network. Again, we do a bit of surgery. We we take uh, we use a custom chain of layers. One one will be the original network, and one will be a constant array that contains the original image in its uh, array parameter. So the name is a bit of a misnomer because this is a constant array when I start, but then I can, if I want, train on this, and this is exactly what I'm doing. So this layer here, I'm using the, again this possibility of uh, training only part of a network. So I'm not touching the original net here, but I'm saying just uh, optimize the input image here that I put in these weights in order to maximize cockroach classification. So what I'm doing here, I'm calling net train, and I'm saying image net of tiger here, and I want this to be cockroach. And then net train is doing the optimization, keeping the network fixed, and changing all the pixel value of a tiger image to force a cockroach classification. So we run this training, and at the end, ta -da, this is the resulting image. You can see, oh, no spoilers, this still looks very much like a tiger, but now, Man, if I apply the network to this image, is very, very confident, 86% sure that this is a cockroach. So what happened? Basically, you can see that the differences were very small, but if we emphasize them, there's no much structure. We have added what looks like um, high frequency noise, but we are added that in the right way to trick the classifier and we move this example to the boundary of the tiger space and uh, uh, into the cockroach space. It's a very high dimensional space, so there are all sorts of uh, um, cranks and nooks where we can 
put this this image and um, given the procedure we have tried here this of course doesn't work if we change network so if you use image identify on the adversarial image is not really adversarial for a different model but uh, given what we learned about this high frequency noise another way to destroy this stack is we just slightly blur the tiger image and this is a tiger again okay sorry uh, i think i still have a little bit of time one thing i can show you is uh, and this i can all evaluate in real time so i can move to my notebook here again and i can show you what we did in uh, um, very very useful domain like text recognition so something that happened in version 12 uh, we have uh, uh, improved a lot the um, accuracy and timing of uh, our built-in text recognizer so you can see the uh, error rate went down 44 uh, percent time spent went down 23 uh, percent um, oh i think very good very solid and uh, as you can see i can put here scan document for people who don't know what this function is doing and what i get out is the tentative recognition so now we go from image to text and we can use this text in the language to do whatever we want with it basically something we have added here is um, a lot more flexibility in uh, in how you can uh, query recognition properties uh, for example here we have uh, standard old text property but we also have the confidence and bounding box in the image and directly the trimming so you can see here i had this image and what i get out is the old result which is a text but also now i can actually query the function for confidence over of a result and get exactly where the text was and if i want just to work with the crop i can just get the cropped image out uh, another useful feature is that uh, now i can specialize the detection this is a whole block of text but i can also ask for line by line recognition or even word by word recognition here i get more like i get tighter bounding boxes around the text so depending on the applications that you have in mind you might want to tailor the recognition to a specific level and here for example this is word level classification on the original image another thing that we have added uh, some images are pretty tricky um, you can help the recognizer by providing a mask which can be either estimated or manually computed and we can see here that we have this double language sign and we see detect the text that is here and the result of the detection using this mask is uh, some gibberish and no parking why do we have some gibberish here uh, i mean the, net, the the function got that there was text here but wasn't able to parse it correctly this is because by default we are using your dollar language setting which right now is english so i can um, actually override this with a specific option and say use this mask but also look for english and chinese text and here this is what i get so i don't speak Chinese and I cannot read Chinese, but just by visual inspection, looks like it's a pretty decent recognition. And uh, maybe one last example for today, to and on a lighter note, uh, bad pun intended, is we can build up our basic recognition uh, functionality to create something more complex and. Uh, create nice applications like uh, reading, uh, like parsing and reading tab uh, images. So this is um, a guitar tab, for example. You can, um, I took this from a Led Zeppelin song, and you can try to guess what it is later. And um, what you can do here is we can use uh, some standard uh, morphological functions in image processing. I leave you to the documentation if you want to understand how they work and to play with them. The basic idea is I want to expand a bit on the black area and then find all the components where you have like 
black patches that are touching each other. And uh, basically, once I compute this, this is my result. So I got an approximation of uh, single lines in my tabs image. Now that we have um, these to use as mask, uh, we can actually call our text recognizer and save the tabs. Let's see, after a bit of cleaning, this is, for example, the first line. I'm taking part one of the tabs, and there's a bunch of nothing and a bunch of numbers. Now I just want to clean it up a bit more, and here it is. This is uh, now the full image converted uh, um, as a some kind of like numerical parsable uh, data. Now that I have this, I just have to plug it in our uh, uh, sound capabilities. Sorry for this random clicking. And uh, if I put this in a sound object, I hope you can hear this. Mm. This was a small thing uh, for the demonstration. I hope you got the song. And if not, we can just put everything in a single function. And then people will be able to use our function like this. And here we are converting everything to a nice audio object, and we can play it. OK, I hope this was uh, interesting. This uh, I like this specifically because it can show how we can bridge different domains. We can go from uh, uh, image uh, standard image processing to text recognition, which is a purely machine learning application. And then we can use built-in audio sound capabilities to convert what we got uh, into actual music. And this is going to be my last example for uh, today. So I hope you enjoy the presentation, and I hope uh, you will be able to uh, play with uh, image and machine learning applications in the Wolfram language. Thank you very much.